come into an understanding that we have to have God. We can't just do this with his help. We can't just do it partly where God gives us assistance. We require completely God's holiness in our eyes and his forgiveness to get us into a state of nature. Our message today is an interesting question. Is evil God's will? Now, I will be honest with you, I get asked a lot of questions as a pastor. And one of the questions that probably the most frequently asked is why is there evil? If God is God, if he can do all things, why in the world does he allow evil? Why is there still evil? And I guess, to be real honest with you, that's a very valid question. Because it does seem that evil is so totally against God's nature that by that, it shouldn't be allowed to exist. But unfortunately, evil does exist. And so if we want the answers, of course, we go to the Bible. And our first scripture today is James 1, 12 through 18. It says, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say who is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my brothers. Every good and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of light, in whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will he brought us forth to the world, if truth, that he should be a ki the kind of first fruits of his creature. So James is very clear. God does not tempt us. God does not condone evil. It does not allow in God's nature for sin to be present with him. So there is no way that evil is part of God's plan. However, we still see plenty of evil. And if you read through James clearly, it says, we are tempted when we are lured by our own desires and no who tempts us with those desires, but Satan. Satan is the author of evil. And he will be, and he continues to be, the author of evil in this world. And unfortunately, because Satan has the ability to influence this world, evil will be present in this world. It is not God's desire that it is there. He certainly does not condone it. But it is allowed to exist because Satan is allowed to do what he does. Now, I will tell you too often, some simplistic theologians will tell you when something tragic happens, like a rape or a genocide or murders, well, that must have been God's will. Now, I'm here to tell you, those things are never God's will. They were never part of God's plan. The Holocaust in Nazi Germany was not God's plan. The rape or the murder of an individual in innocence was not God's plan. Evil exists because Satan allows it and condones it and pursues it in this world. It is not God's plan. Now, there are some who will say, but if God is omniscient, why does he not stop evil? Why doesn't he just take Satan out of the earth and take him away? And I will say that's a valid question because to be honest with you, it would make life a lot simpler if I didn't get tempted. It would make life simpler if things were so clear cut that I only had one clear choice. But the one thing about God is that he allowed free will. 
He has given you and I choices. I can choose to do the right thing or the wrong thing. I go to my doctor and she says, quit eating more candy bars. And then I can go to trunk or treat and see how many candy bars I can eat. I have free will. I don't have to listen to her. In the same way, I don't have to listen to God. And in many cases, mankind does not. And they do very many evil things. And I will say that that's a frustration for Christians. Because we're like, well, if God is God, why, why can't he at least protect me from evil? And I will tell you that there are some questions I can't give you complete answers on. If you're going through struggles and trials, I can't say, well, this is what God has planned for this. This is why God's letting this happen to you in your life. I can't tell you those things. But I can tell you that if you're a Christian, God very much does have control of your life. And I want to look at a guy named Joseph. And most of you know Joseph. Or you've heard of him from the Old Testament. He is the favorite son of Jacob, or more often called Israel. And I will tell you right now, having a favorite child is a mistake. It did not work out well for Joseph. It did not work out well for anyone else that I know. But Joseph's brothers hated him so much they plotted to kill him. And in fact, they threw him in a pit and prepared to kill him. And then suddenly, a caravan of saved traders showed up and they said, why kill this man when we can make a few dollars off of him? And so they sold him into slavery. Now the brothers clearly are planning evil. And one would argue, especially if you're Joseph, God, why did you not intervene here? Why did you not stop them? But I will tell you that there was a plan. The evil that the brothers had worked into a plan that God had that was much bigger than them or Joseph. And we're going to go down to Genesis 50, verses 5 through 21. And we're in a time of famine. Joseph has been in Egypt some 20 or 30 years. He went to prison because he was accused of trying to sexually molest Potiphar's wife, falsely. And he was placed in prison. Now look at this young man's life so far. Dad's favorite. Your brothers plotted to kill you and instead sold you into slavery. You go into slavery and you're falsely accused and put in prison. Joseph would probably very rightfully say to God, you know what, God, I don't think you have a plan here. This is not going the way it should go. And from a human perspective, he would be 100% correct. This doesn't make sense. But as we read Genesis 55 through 21, Joseph is reunited with his brothers. Their father has died, and the brothers are a little bit worried that, you know what? Joseph just kept us alive because dad. And now that dad's dead, we're going to get what we deserve. And trust me, they deserve death. I mean, you wanted to kill your brother? You sold him into slavery? What else would they deserve? So when Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, it may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, Your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, Please forgive the transgressions of your brothers and their sons, because they did evil to you. And now please forgive the brothers and uh, the servants of your God your father. Joseph wept when they said to him, his brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, Do not fear, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring about many people that should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear, I will provide for you and your little ones. Then he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. What Joseph is saying, 
You did something for evil. You took evil and you made a rotten thing. And no one will deny that plotting to kill your brother and then selling him into slavery is anything but evil. But what Joseph saw from a bigger picture, which is what we as Christians need to have, is that bigger picture of why is God allowing evil in our lives. And the truth of it is, had he not been sold into slavery, he would not have been in Potiphar's house. Had he not been in Potiphar's house, he would not have been in prison. Had he not been in prison, he would have not met Pharaoh's cupbearer and interpreted a dream for him. Had he not done that, when Pharaoh had a dream that troubled him greatly, the cupbearer would not remember and say, Joseph can do what you're asking. He can interpret this dream. Joseph went from a hated, sold slave in prison to the number two man in Egypt. There was a friend of mine who always grew up in farm, and he says, Joseph is actually the first secretary of agriculture. And I think there's some truth to that, because he did what most secretary of agriculture want to do. They manage things from the ag point of view. Joseph went to the number two man's job in Egypt because of all the evil done to him. He would not have been where he was had not so much evil been placed upon him. And so, while God did not intend for that evil to happen, he was very much aware that it would happen. And I think too often, we go into a situation where we do not know all the facts. We just simply see the evil around us and being perpetrated on us, and we go, God, this isn't right. It sort of reminds me of a guy that was being tailgated by a stressed out woman and the light turned from yellow to and she thought he'd had enough time to go and so she's really ratting and raving and she's honking her horn and screaming in frustration because she'd missed her chance to get through that intersection and while she's going on and carrying on a policeman came up and knocked on her door and she's like what's he want and she had him step out of the had him step out of the car and put handcuffs on her and took her away. Later, she's like, what went on there? And she said, well, ma'am, you got to understand. I looked at your bumper stickers, and it said, what would Jesus do? And the other bumper sticker says, follow me to Sunday school. And you had a Christian emblem on your car, but you were acting like the worst heathen I've ever met. So obviously, I just assumed you'd stolen this car. I think... I might resemble her a little too much when life goes evil. I may not look like I trust God. I may not look like I am willing to let God handle the hard parts. I may get very mad and frustrated when evil happens, and I am. Part of my old nature as an old cop wants to see justice done when evil is perpetrated. And it's a part of me that will probably always be there, that I want justice. The sad truth of this world is, I do not get true justice in this world. We have an imitation of justice that our criminal justice system does, but it is a poor imitation of what God will do. We have to understand that evil is going to be present in this world, that problems are going to happen, that evil men will do evil deeds and we must understand because unfortunately evil is not going to disappear. Now I've quoted to you Romans 8 28 hundreds of times but it's going to be again because it's a good verse. And it says and we know all things for all, uh, we know that for those who love the Lord, all things work together for the good of those who are called according to his purpose. We see that in Joseph's life. Everything that was evil in his life worked to good. He saved thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people during that famine. God did something good 
despite all the evil. You and I, if we are Christians, can claim that verse and say, no matter what happens to me, no matter what evil comes around me and affects me, God can take care of it. Now, I am here to tell you, that doesn't mean you're going to understand it clearly like Joseph did. You may live and die without ever completely understanding. And you may very well, like I have many times, go to God and say, why God? This isn't right. Why do you allow it? Why are there so much suffering in this world? You are like a child trying to understand adult situations. And we cannot grasp. Make no mistake, evil is never God's will or desire. God never condones evil. He does have the power to intervene, and in cases like Joseph, I believe he does. His brothers were going to kill him when suddenly a slave caravan showed up. Trust me, that caravan was no accident. God knew that Joseph was worth more to them being sold as a slave than a dead brother laying in a pit. But God did not eliminate all the evil that Joseph was, had done against him. And so Joseph had to go down a path and have faith in God, even though the world around him suggested that God was not in control. Even though everything that he did seemed to backfire in his face because he kept getting accused and being neglected. I would love to see all evil disappear from the face of the earth. I would love to have that happen. And while I am quick to condemn the mass murderer, I have to be acknowledging one fact, that Jesus Christ said, if I have anger in my heart against a brother, I have committed murder. The reason God does not eliminate all evil from the face of the earth is a simple fact that will not be comfortable for any of us, including me. It is, my friends, because in your heart, you are basically evil. You may not be Adolf Hitler, but you have anger. You've had greed. You've had lust. You've had envy. You've had all the things that God tells you you should not have. And just because I have not committed mass murder, of all the times in my life where I've had unrestrained anger, my sin and the evil that that sin had is no less than any other murderer. I do not want to make anything less clear than this. You do not murder other people without anger being first the foremost emotion in your heart. Anger is the beginning and anger is the end. It is destructive. And I will tell you, we want to take and remove that from ourselves. We want to say, no, 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 no. Adolf Hitler was in a different class than I am. But in God's eyes, we are both in the same class. Because evil has a way of warping what you're saying and doing. He can tell you that while you may be envious of somebody else, it's okay because they were blessed with so much more and you just have always had to struggle. You can be angry with this person because, well, let's face it, they're just not nice people. So you have the right to be angry with that person. Evil has a way of twisting that mindset to give you that idea that we perceive as righteous anger. And that, my friends, is the first step towards evil. To allow myself to believe 
that what God has told me was wrong. When I suggest that I have a right to be angry with a brother, I tell Jesus Christ when he says you have sinned when you are angry with a brother, that Jesus doesn't know what he's talking about. Now, no one will sit in church and say that. But I trust me, we have all said it in our minds at some point in our lives when we were angry with somebody. We see evil in others clearly and well-defined. Less so in ourselves. Evil lurks within us and is able to be cultivated by Satan with all what we need is to allow it. When I am able to rationalize or justify any number of things that God considers sin, I will then start down the road of evil. To be redeemed by God, I must first acknowledge that I am evil. That there is a part of me that will never be pure. Paul said it so wonderfully in, uh, I believe it was Romans, where he says, there's a part of me that wants to do good, but I fail to do it. And there's a part of me that doesn't want to do evil, but I do it anyway. The truth of the matter is, our human nature is born of evilness, and we will continue in evilness because of our evil payer. Now that's depressing. But the truth of it is, when you look at it from God's perspective, he doesn't see this evil person or that evil person, and this is a good evil person or that's a really bad evil person. He just sees evil in the hearts of man that needs to be repented, that needs to change. And I'll be honest with you, I have to adopt it through God's eyes before I'm going to see it properly. There's a story of a teacher who found a group of kids huddled in a corner and they were doing something suspicious. And so she demanded to know what they were doing. And they, she says, what are you kids doing? And they said, we're shooting craps. And she goes, oh, that's fine. I was afraid you were praying because that's illegal in today's day. Much like that teacher, we are a little bit like that as Christians. We condone things within ourselves and others that is evil while trying to look at others and say, well, that person's not quite to that character. The church has been accused of being hypocrite for a long time. And to some degree, we have to accept that criticism accurately. When we look at others and say, you miserable, rotten sinners, you need to be get more like us, holy and pure and clean. We are hypocrites. I am only holy, pure, and clean because Jesus Christ has forgiven the evilness in my heart. He has taken it away at my request and wiped it clean. And the sad truth is, 30 seconds after I was saved, evil thoughts came back into my mind. So it is a process. Uh, you farmers who've got livestock know that when you have livestock in a barn, you can go in and clean the barn. But it will not stay clean, will it? It will continue to need to be scooped. And the truth of it is, as a Christian, you will continue to have a need for a pitchfork of salvation. There is evil in you. So why does God allow evil? Very simply. To eliminate it would mean to eliminate us all. Those of us in churches, those of us in terrible positions of evil, Evil is here because mankind is here and we listen too much to Satan. If we want evil to disappear, we must first look at ourselves and say, God, do not allow evil to come into my life. 
Do not allow me to be subdued by evil. God allows evil because evil people need salvation. I am no better, and I've said this many times, I am no better a person than Adolf Hitler was. No better than Judy, uh, Pontius Pilate. No better than any other person in history. The only difference is that Jesus Christ offered me salvation and forgiveness for that evil within me. And I accepted it. And I can't get too grandiose about the fact that, no, nah, I'm forgiven, so I need to judge all the rest of them folks. Because I realize, as much as I'd like to think I'm different, I very much am still very much like those folks. A Christian and the bumper sticker that said, be patient, God is not through with me yet, is probably the most accurate theological statement there is. A Christian is on a process of being changed by God, of taking bad and evil behaviors and changing them towards a more godlike attitude. To the point that I listen to God, the better I'm going to be. To the point that I do not listen to God, that I do not read my Bible, that I do not pray, I will not change the evil within me. So to ask that fundamental or answer that fundamental question, why does God allow evil? It's because, my friends, He loves those evil people, and He desires for them to be saved, and He desires for you and I to show them the light that we have seen, and that we ourselves will follow that light more purposely denying the evil within us so that we too can see less and less evil in our hearts and our minds and our lives and more of God. So God will never approve or condone of evil. And I guess that leaves us with the realization that the only thing we can do to fight evil is to tell ourselves I will not condone that in my own life. When I find myself angry with a brother or a sister, I will not feed that, even if I'm justified. I will not fight or fancifully condone the idea that, gee, I should have what everybody else has. I should not give into the idea that if God would only give me what this is or that is, you know, I don't know how many people have told me that, Rick, if I win the lottery, I'm going to give the church a whole lot of money. And you know, that's a wonderful th thought. The truth of it is, I can tell you statistically from people who do win the lottery, that some do give some to the church, but very few. If you want to know how much you would give to the church if you won the lottery, Look at your checkbook and see what you give now. The percentage will probably be about the same. You will do what you are doing now. You will allow in your mind what you allow now. If you want to change, if you want to battle evil in this world, battle it first within yourself and then look to the world. Because once I have defeated evil within myself, then I can truly speak to the world about them needing to turn away from it also. It's hard pressed to tell a person that they need a bath when I'm filthy. But that's what we're trying to do in the church today. We're going out of the world with clothes that need washed. We haven't showered in months, if not years. And we're telling the world, you need to change. And the world's looking and going, I'm cleaner than you are. And rightfully so. I hate to say it, but some of the worst sins committed in the last three decades have been committed by people who profess to be Christians. Some of them by people who are leaders in the church. And that is sad. 
but it's because there are evil people in this world doing evil things. Only through our own desire to change evil will evil determine to go away. We can overcome evil, but only through God's help. And it must start within ourselves. Thank you.